So first of all, I want to thank you all for attending today. I'm really excited to share the work that I've been leading with Bob Haight from the USDA Forest Service, which is focused on increasing the efficiency of watercraft inspection programs through coordination and collaboration. In today's presentation, I'll begin with a background about watercraft inspections in Minnesota. I'll describe our objectives for this research and provide you guys with an overview of the methods that we used. Next, I'll describe a baseline model for the optimal statewide coordination. Then I'll describe a model for optimal bi-level coordination, which accounts for an initial allocation of funding to the state and then to the counties to use those resources at the county level. I'll then follow this with an overview of the work that we've done on identifying potential county collaborations. And I'll conclude with some planned updates to the online dashboard AIS Explorer. As you're all likely well aware, management of AIS in Minnesota largely takes place at the state and local level. At the state level, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources Invasive Species Program works to prevent introductions of new invasive species into the state, and they also prevent the spread of invasive species already in the state. And then at the local level, counties work with other local government units to limit the spread of AIS within the county. And this is largely supported by the AIS prevention aid that disperses approximately $10 million a year amongst the counties. And that's based on the number of watercraft trailer launches and parking spaces. And a common prevention activity that counties rely on is watercraft inspections. And they aim to limit the spread of AIS by thoroughly inspecting and decontaminating boats as they enter and exit lakes. And they're also really useful in educating boaters on AIS prevention. But there are a lot of challenges in developing and implementing effective watercraft inspection programs with limited resources. One of those, the vast number of lakes that exist here in Minnesota. And another is the large number of recreational boats that move across the landscape. In fact, in 2019, Minnesota had an estimated 880,000 registered watercraft. And since many freshwater AAS remain viable during the overland dispersal, such as boat transport, it can be really difficult to manage the spread of AAS from lake to lake. So with these challenges in mind, we had two main objectives for this work. The first was to identify the most efficient placement of watercraft inspectors at the state level with and without consideration of county boundaries. And we did this as a conceptual exercise to get an understanding of the interactions between boat movements and management scenarios on prioritizing research resources under different conditions. And our second objective was to identify groups of counties that could work together to increase the efficient placement of watercraft inspectors and then to share this framework with counties to help promote collaboration. To do this, we used an integer linear programming model to compare five different scenarios. The first two scenarios addressed our first objective and identified the optimal placement of watercraft inspectors at the state level with and without the consideration of county boundaries and considered starry stonewort, zebra mussels, and Eurasian water milfoil as species of interest. And the following three scenarios addressed our second objective of identifying the county collaborations and compared their performance to both a statewide scenario and a countywide scenario. The countywide scenario in this model was based on budget levels that were proportional to the county's AIS prevention aid, and that varied a little bit from the statewide and countywide scenarios from objective one. And I'll get into that a little bit further. The collaborations in this um, second uh, portion or objective two considered the same species as those in objective one, but we also added spiny water flea to the analysis. And one thing to note is that the integer programming model that we are um, sharing here today are similar to those that have been presented by Bob and I in previous showcases. And an example of the countywide model was published in Biological Invasions in 2001, and I have that um, here. So to create the collaborations, we aim to identify win-win scenarios that might exist between counties. And while there's a variety of different measures that we could use to identify smaller parts of boater movement networks that represent uh, higher levels of connection, we really wanted to select an approach that was thoughtful and really context specific. So we chose an approach that included a measure of reciprocity, which I'll explain in further detail as we move forward. 
For those networks, we use the 2014 to 2017 voter networks that estimated the annual movement of votes between lakes and Minnesota using watercraft inspection data. And it also accounted for uninspected lakes and bias due to unequal effort. And this work was also published in Biological Invasions last year. And I have the um, citation there for that below. And we also use the Minnesota DNR infested waters list to identify risky boats, which are those that move from infested to uninfested waters. And we used the 2019 infestation status to try to keep things relevant to the date where we um, started this study, um, but also closely linked to the movement data that we were using within the models. So focusing further on objective one, for the statewide scenario, the objective was to select lakes for inspection stations to maximize the number of risky boats inspected across the state. So we used constraints within this model that was a counter for the number of invaders that could be moved between lakes, an inequality for a binary variable to describe whether risky boats are inspected or not when they move between lakes. We used an upper bound on lakes selected for inspection, and I also refer to this as a budget. And then we solve the model for optimal statewide coordination under alternative levels of a budget. And what we saw was that the number of risky boats inspected increased with diminishing returns. Almost all risky boats were inspected by selecting 400 lakes, which accounts for about 725,000 risky boats inspected. And this result makes sense because in our data set at the time when we were analyzing this, there were 471 infested lakes and all the risky goat boats could be inspected um, if we placed inspectors at each of those lakes. To show how the selected lakes were distributed amongst the counties, this map is color coded according to the number of selected lakes. And this is based on that 400 lake solution. So here we can see the darker colors represent more lakes that were selected. And lakes selected for the statewide scenario were uh, located in 48 counties. And so the top six counties shown on the table on the right include 183 selected lakes, which is almost half of the total budget. So these counties were located in the Twin Cities Metro and in central Minnesota, and the counties are those that have the most lakes with the most risky boat traffic. The model for optimal statewide coordination assumes that we have a state planner that selects lakes for inspection stations directly. And we know that in real life in Minnesota here, um, that this doesn't really apply. Instead, what we see is that funds are allocated to counties based on boat launches and parking spots at lakes for each county. Then the county planner decides where to locate inspection stations according to the local objectives. So rather than allocating funds based on boat ramps and parking spots, we set up our bi-level model using two different assumptions. The first was that a state planner allocates resources to counties to maximize the number of risky boats inspected statewide. And then the county planner uses those resources to select lakes for inspection stations that maximize the number of risky boats inspected within the county. And so this problem is solved using backwards induction, which means that first we solve each county problem with a wide range of budgets. And then the state planner allocates funds to counties that maximize the state's objective function, um, assuming that each county planner will use its own optimal lake selections under given um, funding or given uh, budget constraints. And so for this, we found that like the statewide model, the number of risky boats inspected in the bi-level model also increased with diminishing returns, but that there were less than the number of risky boats inspected um, in the optimal statewide coordination. In fact, almost all the risky boats were inspected by selecting 700 lakes and 600,000 600, risky boats were inspected when 400 lakes were selected, which is about 17% less than with the optimal statewide coordination. And this slide compares how the selected lakes for the statewide coordination compare with the bi-level allocation of inspection stations. In the bi-level model, the lakes are selected in 39 counties compared to that 48 from the statewide coordination. And for uh, those counties with more than 20 lakes selected, the number of lakes selected by county are similar between the two solutions. So from objective one, uh, we found that the statewide model, um, almost, in the statewide model, almost all risky boats can be inspected by putting inspectors at those 400 lakes. 
Most of the lakes are already infested with one or more invasive species, and they have uh, large amounts of outgoing boat traffic that travel to uninfested lakes. And while we know that in Minnesota, in Minnesota statewide coordination isn't used for watercraft inspections, our statewide model can be used as a baseline to evaluate the efficiency of actual or proposed inspection stations. And we found that the bi-level approach wasn't as efficient as the statewide coordination. And while the bi-level approach, as we laid out here, is also not used for watercraft inspection planning, both of these models provide us with a framework for understanding how optimal solutions might change under different management scenarios. Furthermore, there are lots of interesting extensions from our inspection models, and we're always continuing to develop models that help us understand these issues further and are really um, trying, we're ultimately trying to find solutions that are useful for state and local planners. And so for our second objective, we were asking um, which counties could collaborate to increase efficient placement of watercraft inspectors. And we compared statewide, countywide, um, and collaboration scenarios. And we, again, we considered starry stonewort, zebra mussels, Eurasian water milfoil, and spiny water flea. And for this objective, we chose to focus on identifying those win-win scenarios between pairs of counties. So let's take, for example, here, County A and County B. There's really four possible outcomes that could arise when we consider pairwise relationships. So we can say that either County A and B are not connected, meaning there's no risky boats move between A and B. Or we can say that County A sends risky boats to B, County B, or that County B sends risky boats to A, or that County A and B send risky boats to each other. And if they do, we consider this a reciprocal relationship, setting up a potential win-win situation for both counties should they choose to collaborate around watercraft inspection plans. So for each county in Minnesota, we identified the number of risky boats traveling from outside the county, and then we ranked them based on the sending county. So for example, here we have County A, and we can see that the top three sources for risky boats are County B, C, and D. And for County B, the top three sources are A, C, and D. And since B receives the highest number of risky boats from A and A from B, we classified this as a reciprocal relationship where we present it as a line that exists between these two counties that in network terms are considered nodes. And then if we extend this concept beyond the top senders to the top three senders, and then we add a couple of more counties, we see more reciprocal relationships become apparent. So we have A and B along with D and B, and then we also have C and D. So let's take a moment to consider how that might look as a network moving beyond these um, two counties. So I'll give you a moment to think about what you might expect that structure to look like. So you might have come up with something like this in your mind where county A and B are connected, B and D are connected, and D and C are connected. And so we did that for all the counties in the state. We started with the top senders, and then we worked our way down the list until we ended up with one large group. And we shared the results of this work uh, last year at the showcase, and I've updated the analysis to include species-specific infestation statuses and movements. So the results are a little different. You might notice some slight changes. For the first ranking, we observed one pair that included Carver and Hennepin County. For the second ranking, we had three groups comprised of Carver, Hennepin, Wright, Crow Wing, and Cass, and Ramsey and Washington. Uh, for the third, we saw one group of Carver, Hennepin, Crow Wing, Cass, and Stearns, and another of Anoka, Ramsey, and Washington. For the first, for the fourth, we saw that the second group then merged with the first, and that St. Louis and Lake then joined the mix, and that Otter Tail and Douglas formed a group. And then for the fifth, we had one large group with Beltrami added into um, the group. And because we know that one large collaborative group is not really functional and that small collaborative groups fall apart if even one member chooses not to participate, we turn to focus on the group with the top three senders, which produced an average group size of four and a half. 
And so this figure shows uh, the magnitude of the relationships that were formed using these collaborations. And so here in the upper right side of the figure, we can see Ramsey and Noka and Washington in that collaboration. And then the rain, remaining portion of the circles represents Crow Wing, Carver, Wright, Hennepin, Cass, and Stearns. And so the way this figure works is the color of the lines that go across the circle represents the number of risky boats coming from the county of origin um, with the matching color. So for example, here we see the big purple line moving across the circle. That rep represents boats that move from crowing to cast. And then the black line shows the boats moving from cast into crowing. And so for the most part, we can see that the amount of boats being sent between counties is relatively similar, except that large number of boats that I highlighted being sent um, from crowing to cast in that purple line. In this figure, I'm showing the results of the integer programming model um, on the x-axis is the number of inspection stations and on the y is the number of risky boats inspected. In orange, we have the results of the statewide uh, scenario and purple is the collaboration scenario and in blue is the countywide scenario. And we can see that in all three scenarios, like we observed before, the number of risky boats inspected increases as the number of inspection stations increase with diminishing returns. And here we can see that the statewide scenario outperforms the collaboration scenario and the countywide scenario for all budget levels. And just to remind you guys, this is similar to the statewide approach that we used previously, only we've included spiny water flea here. And this statewide model, just as we saw in objective one, the number of risky boats observed peaked around 400 inspection stations. And then past that, we didn't really gain any more um, significant uh, gains by, by placing more inspectors. So the collaboration scenario resulted in more um, risky boat inspections than the county level model. Uh, it outperformed it by about 65,000 risky boats when we considered a budget level of 400. And that represents about 8% uh, of the possible risky boats. And so these findings indicate that collaborations between counties may be a way to build on all the benefits of local level initiatives while also increasing efficiency. So in order to support collaborations between counties, we're working on an update to the AS Explorer Watercraft Inspections tab, which is available at www.asexplorer.umn.edu. And if you're not familiar with AS Explorer, you can check out more information at maysurc.umn.edu slash news slash AS Explorer. Uh, the tab updates will display outputs of the collaboration work and the results will be uh, reconfigured as infestations are reported in real time um, as the rest of the dashboard currently works. There's a mock-up, uh, this is a mock-up of the proposed changes um, and they're still in the design phase. So the outputs don't wholly match the data um, and are used for conceptual purposes only. And in some parts you might realize that um, some of the text doesn't really even make sense. It's just here for, um, again, conceptual purposes. So um, the tab will be available. These tabs will be available. Um, for counties that are part of the collaboration network. So here I'm showing um, uh, the results of counties that rankings did result in a spot in a collaboration network. And then on the right, users will see popular lakes in their county and which lakes they are connected to. And so that's um, those outside of their, their county. The app will also include some form of group planning, which um, the name is subject to change, but the concept will likely stay the same, in which the results will show the optimization algorithm that's currently running in AIS Explorer. Um, but the results will update so that there's uh, a consideration of multiple counties based on the collaboration network results and the user selections. And then lastly, the app will have a feature where two counties can see how their inspection plans might impact the ranking of another county. So for example, here we have Aiken um, and Crowing. And Aiken can confirm the placement of inspectors um, on lakes within their county and see how that might modify the ranking of inspection stations in Crowing County. 
Unlike the other feature I showed, this one will be available for all the counties in the state and not this, just those that um, were part of the collaboration network. So with that, I'd like to recognize the collaborators that helped make this work possible. Denise Yemshinov from the Canadian Forest Service, Nick Phelps, Meg Dewar, and Alex Badges from Macer, and Nick Snellgrove, Petra and Willie Mueller from Epi Interactive. I'd also like to thank our stakeholders that provided us with valuable feedback on our watercraft inspection work over the years. And with that, I look forward to hearing your questions. All right, thank you, Amy, for that excellent talk. Um, we do have four questions so far in the Q&A box. Um, I will just read them out to you and sure. um, you can respond. So this comes from Amanda up in Cook County. I'm wondering, is this, are you suggesting that the AIS prevention aid potentially be allocated differently to counties to maximize optimal risky boat contact? Yeah, so when the, when the chats come in through the talks, sometimes it's hard for me um, to tell exactly which portion this is pertaining to, but I think, um, I think I'm following that question. So um, no, I, the suggestion isn't that we're proposing that the prevention aid is allocated differently. The, the prevention aid goes towards a lot of activities that go beyond watercraft inspections. Um, but we did want to explore uh, different scenarios in which resources were allocated in different ways just to get an understanding of how um, taking a look at the management from the state level down into the county level and that fragmentation can play a role in, in gains or losses in efficiency. So it was more of a conceptual question in that bi-level model where we um, kind of went that route. Um, and so that's that's really not, that we really, it wasn't really the objective there to, to make that point. Um, in the collaboration model, we handled the county's distribution of funds slightly differently, and we had it proportional to the AS prevention aid. And in there, we're just kind of making assumptions that everybody's using resources that um, towards watercraft inspections that are proportional to the budget they receive. So again, kind of more of this um, conceptual idea of um, how efficiency potentially could be gained through collaborations. So thinking more of it as a a baseline or just a framework for which we can um, uh, wrap our heads around what, what this means. Thanks, Amy. Mm -hmm. um, next one is from Bill Granchies in Itasca. Um, how did you account for counties that receive AIS funding in addition to the AIS aid from the states such as levies? Yeah, so we didn't account for that. We just um, can use that more simplified approach where we said, um, what is the AIS county aid that they received? Um, if I remember correctly, we were looking at the 2020 distribution of um, funds and said, what uh, of the total, what proportion did each county receive? And then when we looked at different budgets, um, we, we um, had that budget proportional to the proportion of AIS funds. So we didn't, we didn't take those into account. Uh, next question is from Alicia in Wright County. Were you able to normalize the number of hours that each county currently inspects, um, i.e. counties putting a large number of hours will naturally have a high number of inspections? Is that um, sense? Yeah, so I, I think this question is addressing um, the network construction. And so um, Alicia, you can Kind of respond with a follow-up if if I'm kind of moving in the wrong direction here. But whenever we created the networks, um, we did take into account counties that had higher numbers of hours and we had to normalize the data. Um, it wasn't just counties that had, had high numbers of values, but those varied amongst um, access points as well. And so um, all of that was accounted for in the data cleaning. And if you um, follow up on the paper that was linked as the citation, there's a little bit more information in there and that should be um, open access. So everyone should have access to, to that paper. Okay. And was there like an example budget used for the budget for one inspection station in, in the study? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think that point maybe came across um, a little unclear. So what we ended up doing was considering a wide range of budgets. So we would say, what would happen if we really constrained the budget and only looked at um, 
allocating maybe five inspectors across the state. And we moved all the way up to, um, you know, over 700 or 800 in some of the scenarios or upwards towards those values. So we're kind of testing a range of different budget levels, not really just one. And, and I really use that 400 as that point where I was kind of comparing against the different scenarios, because that was the one we could also um, see a lot of differences kind of play out in the different scenarios and also wrap our head around, well, what does that actually mean um, in terms of being able to effectively um, manage the spread? As I said, we can um, place inspectors at almost all of the um, infested water bodies by looking at that 400 value. So it's just a little bit um, easier for us to kind of conceptualize the meaning of the results. Um, question, Alex or Amy, when do we think that these updates to the AIS Explorer mm -hmm. dashboard will, <laughs> will be available for folks? And maybe mention some of the workshops that we've been discussing too. Yeah, that's a great question, Cole, and I'm excited that um, you're asking this question because I hope that means that you're excited about these. Um, and so right now, the plan for development is that we will be working to wrap up most of this around the November timeframe. So it should be fully functional and available um, in AS Explorer. We're also hoping to do some um, workshops, as Meg mentioned, uh, in the late winter to get folks who aren't familiar with AIS Explorer on board with um, what the what the key functions are and how they work and how they can use it in making um, management decisions. We also want to highlight what's new. So we want to talk about what the um, latest changes are. I'm showing updates for um, the watercraft inspection portion, but we're also going to have updates to the risk model that includes um, interventions. And I think Alex is um, going to present on that later today. So I'll let him chime in um, on that. Oh, I don't know if we have Alex right now. Maybe he's oh, okay. So, That's okay. But um, yeah, just so folks know, if you didn't catch this little detail, um, in the same web room from eleven fifteen to twelve, um, Alex and I are going to be giving kind of a lightning round of all the different Maceric online tools, of which AIS Explorer is a is a heavy hitter in that suite of options. And we'll be talking. Alex is going to preview some of the new features. And we'll hopefully be getting people excited about these workshops. We don't have anything scheduled yet, but um, it is in the works. Mm -hmm. If you're really interested, if you reach out to us, we'll make sure that your name is part of that and um, we get you fit into a worksheet. Yep, you'll definitely be hearing from us more yep. on that soon. Uh, another question from Amanda. Um, what years of survey data were used? Oh, great question, Amanda. Mm -hmm. So the networks were constructed using um, 2014 to 2017 inspection data. And so uh, we're aware that that data is um, probably ready for an update. So that's one of the future directions of this work that we're going to hone in um, in the next few months. Uh, to come, we're going to look at uh, what the, the um, more updated inspection data looks like and how that compares to the networks that we created before. So hopefully we'll be able to understand a little bit more about how these patterns change over time. Okay, so we have a question from Dana up in CAS where they have many accesses on one lake. <laughs> um, those 400 lakes in, that, um, in the scenario and the example we talked about, um, do we know how many actual public accesses were on those lakes? Oh, that's a great question. So I think the point that Dana is highlighting here is that the analysis was done at this lake level, but that each lake has multiple access points. And to be honest, Dana, I don't know off the top of my head how many public access points there are. Um, I can kind of, uh, I'm thinking how I could go through and potentially crunch those numbers. If you had a, a specific question about your county, I can help um, kind of run through that and crunch some numbers for you if that would be helpful. But off the top of my head, unfortunately, I don't. This is a good one. Um, will the new update allow for viewing data by month? Because um, seasonal changes mm -hmm. in a local network factors into how many of us staff and decrease the amount of money and time spent. Yeah, that's a great point. And so um, uh, another key assumption about uh, the results that we're showing here is that this is all based on annual boat movements. And so our, our networks were constructed to estimate, again, those aggregated 
number of boats that are moving from infested to uninfested water bodies. And so we aren't really taking into account seasonal changes and local network fact, um, factors. But I think that's a really interesting question. And um, I know this is from an anonymous person, but we're always thinking about ways where we can capture a little bit more granularity. Um, a lot of times there's just lo logistical um, constraints around that, but um, always happy to think about that further and, and kind of brainstorm maybe some some projects where we can can get there. Mm -hmm. And just to add to that, one project that we've been just talking about hasn't really mm -hmm. taken off quite yet is um, working with Justin Townsend in Ramsey County um, through MnDOT. He has access to a program called Streetlight that uses um, anonymized um, mobile phone data about mm -hmm. movement patterns, and you can get some pretty specific insights on where and where people are coming from and when the high traffic times are for specific areas like a public launch in um, in a county park or something like that. So we've got a couple of people looking into that. Um, there's lots lots of discussions and hopefully one of these days we'll we'll be able to dig into that. Great point, Meg. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, just a nice comment from Bill Granchies. Great topic. Fantastic research. Um, thanks for the feedback, Bill. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, and now from Jake Walsh. Is the voter movement data resolved enough to have the study unit be accesses rather than lakes? Yeah, so at this point, it's not. Um, as I mentioned before, our, our unit of analysis really is, is at that lake level. Um, and I see Alex responding here. Uh, kind of like looking at variability um, across the season, it, it's something that's really interesting to us and that we would really want to be able to um, take into account as we move forward. Um, and as we go through and develop these updated voter networks, um, I think that's an area that we'll uh, explore a bit further. All right. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody.